So uh, I know we'll get into a lot of specifics in a bit, but um, first, I think let's start with some some bigger picture. You know, Latin America is farther away from China than any other part of the globe. But the Chinese Communist Party is heavily involved there. How did the CCP gain economic influence there? Why is it interested in Latin America? Well, I think, yeah, so I think there's a lot of lot to unpack. Um, and you're right, it, it's very, I just came back from Japan. And so that flight from Latin America from South America, so that flight is, is tremendously long uh, and very few direct. Um, and so how did China encroach into Latin America? Uh, let me begin with the why, and, and then I'll, I'll get into the how. Uh, the why, I think two fundamental reasons. One was China has a global strategy. They have uh, an idea of how they want to conquer the world. Uh, and they're leaving really no stone unturned. Uh, and a big part of that strategy is taking over what they call the global South, uh, South Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. Um, and so uh, the, it, it was in their sphere of uh, ambition. Uh, so that's what the first big uh, reason. The second is uh, no secret, the proximity to the United States. I mean, this is pretty just picking up to where the Soviet Union left off during the Cold War. Uh, and the re- same reason the Soviets uh, made Latin America priorities, the same reason China has made Latin America priority, because they look at it as a way to offset the United States. If they could take the United States out of its own neighborhood, then obviously their ambitions in uh, the South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific become much more realistic for them. So that's the why. Uh, Latin America is the other side of the Pacific. So when we talk about having a true Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, uh, from China, going from the South China Sea to the Panama Canal is critically important, you know, because if they could break those chain of island nations and get into the blue water uh, of the Pacific, they need to have a destination of where to end up. Uh, and we could talk a little bit about how they've been doing that. But let me get specifically into the beginning of where this really happened, because in the 20th century, this wasn't really a story. The, China had some activities in Latin America, but it was not very significant. Uh, the story really begins at the dawn of the 21st century. Uh, and and I would point to the visit that Hu Jintao did to Latin America in 2004. Uh, this was a very prominent visit because he made a very broad claim. He said he was going to pour $100 billion into the region uh, within the next six years. By two, 2010, uh, that China was going to invest, trade, uh, pour $100 billion into the region. That obviously got the eyes and the attention uh, and the ears of many Latin American governments. Uh, everyone perked up. But the real story of how that was accomplished, and, and it was accomplished, China, I think by 2010, had uh, already uh, traded investment of upwards of $180 billion. So they went pretty much from nil to $180 billion in Latin America in 10 years, or less wow. than 10 years, really. Wow. So how did they do that? So this is, this is a story also of uh, malign intent and U.S. neglect. Uh, let me start with the neglect part. Because in 2008, um, we had the financial crisis, 2008-2009. Uh, part of that financial crisis affected the largest multilateral lending institution in Latin America, for Latin America, which is called the Inter-American Development Bank. It's like a mini World Bank for Latin America. Um, in 2008, they were one of the worst uh, managed uh, international multilateral financial institutions. And because they had done a lot of partnerships for the inf- infrastructure loans with Nationwide Bank, they were uh, subjected to subprimes, meaning that they uh, lost a lot of money in the financial crisis. Uh, to the tune of about $1 billion uh, in the red. So this is a multilateral bank that's poorly managed that's about to default because they don't have the money. They're they're in the red. Uh, United States is upwards of a 40% shareholder. We're the largest shareholder of the American Development Bank. Um, it's a 60-year uh, institution. Um, and so the, the bank goes to the United States to recapitalize. They ask for, basically ask for a bailout, and the United States was bailing out other banks. Uh, we decided not to bail out the bank because there was obviously a lot of uh, other priorities at the time. Uh, you guys remember Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs. Uh, and that gave an opportunity for China. China comes in and becomes a member of the largest multilateral lending institution in Latin, for Latin America, the Inter-American Development Bank, at a very minority percent shareholder. I'm talking about 0.004%. Like the, they paid no more than $20 million. I think it was Macedonia or or one of those countries in the Balkans that exited the bank and that provided the opportunity for them to be a shareholder. Um, but they did something else. They did something that for the first time in the 60 year history of this institution, they uh, over and above their what their membership was, the 
0.004% or 20 million, they paid what's called an entrance fee. No other member in the history of the bank has ever paid an entrance fee to join the bank. But they paid an entrance fee, and you can uh, guess what that amount was. A billion? It was close to. It was, it was a little more than half a billion dollars. Uh, and what they essentially did was they bailed out the Inter-American Development Bank and called, according to the former president of the Inter-American Development Bank that actually told me the story, recounted it, uh, they played what he called an institutional kickback. And they subverted this uh, institution. And how does that story unfold to today? Well, since 2010, most, if not almost all, of the major credits and loans that the Inter-American Development Bank has given to Latin America, and remember, the United States is still a 40% shareholder of the bank, has been, by kind of this co-opting, matched by the Export-Import Bank of China. So they actually use the Inter-American Development Bank to plus themselves up so that they can couple their loans and that's how they get to this huge economic influence that they have today. So it's not an exaggeration to say that the United States, through a misguided policy, uh, we co-finance China's rise in Latin America. So essentially now, when there's big development projects in any of Latin America's 20 plus countries, the if the American Development Bank is involved, China is involved. For the most part, what they call they call it this, they call this a special development initiative is what they created out of this big, uh, basically, uh, membership that they had inside the Inter-American Development Bank. And they focused on giving loans to the most authoritarian countries in the region. They gave a lot of their loans to Venezuela, uh, to Haiti, to Nicaragua, uh, some to Guyana, uh, but especially those first three. And, and we can talk about Venezuela in a second, because Venezuela is the largest uh, beneficiary, the largest recipient of Chinese credits and loans, not not trade and investment, but credits and basically money that they're giving to prop it up. Um, and and it, to the tune of about $60 billion. And many people, many analysts thought that China made a huge mistake because they put all this money into Venezuela. Venezuela is an economic disaster, had one of the highest inflations in the world. I mean, we all know the story of Venezuela. It's basically a, a, a socialist malpractice. Well, it's, it's an economic malpractice because of socialist policies. Uh, but anyway, I think what many people confuse is they thought that China was actually making an economic investment. I don't believe they were. They bought a country uh, for $60 billion. They basically bought a country and they're not expecting to be paid back financially through those loans. They're expecting to be uh, uh, actually being able to use that economic influence for, to be able to entrench themselves and spread it throughout the rest of the hemisphere. I want to ask a bit about Venezuela since you brought it up. So Venezuela is under the Maduro regime, has been supported by China through this $60 billion. But also, there's other specific ways that the Chinese Communist Party has kind of uh, had their political influence there uh, and international relations influence there. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, kind of continuing with this you know, line of thinking, China built their economic influence through methods of coercion, subversion, and you know, they co-opted a financial institution, major financial institution, and they targeted really Venezuela at the beginning because Venezuela was going through this uh, transformation under Hugo Chavez in his uh, so-called Bolivarian Revolution, which is basically a socialist autocrat project to capture the country and then uh, spread the tentacles of that country throughout the region. They created this thing called the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas in 2004, uh, 2005, which basically includes Cuba, Nicaragua, Bolivia, at one time Ecuador, and a bunch of Caribbean satellites. Uh, these are This is the authoritarian bloc of Latin America. And what China did was China lifted that block up, not just by servicing these credits and loans. They gave a lot to Ecuador as well. But what they did is they used the ALBA to shield its true ambition in Latin America, which is military in nature. And, and so I think the 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 um, angle that I think we're most uh, focused on today uh, is satellite tracking stations. Uh, Latin America is the largest region in the world for Chinese space infrastructure. They have 11 satellite tracking. They have 11 ground satellite tracking stations in South America, and the original ones, uh, the, and also the biggest ones, are located in Argentina and Venezuela. It's managed by a PLA offshoot called uh, CLTC, which is basically works directly for the Strategic Support Force of the PLA. And in you know China has three deep space stations uh, in, in existence as of right now two in mainland and one in Argentina. But that Argentina space station is connected to Venezuela. The one in Venezuela is on a military base. It's on a, a air base in a uh, military air base in a state called Guarico inside Venezuela. So it's on, a, it's on a Venezuelan military base. 
It is. It's it's a Venezuelan military air base. And inside that air base, uh, it's called the Capitan Manuel Rios Air Base. And inside that air base, China has a, a, the same kind of satellite tracking station, a bit smaller, uh, but connected to the one in Argentina. That project was created very early on. What it did is it, China was beginning to build concessions into specific military installations, as well as specific territories of Venezuela to, in the future, use Venezuela as a launch pad for further military uh, operations. Argentina was, uh, the, the space station Argentina was an extension of that effort, but it began in Venezuela. Venezuela.